Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. Know How is brought to you by Lynda.com. Learn what you want, when you want, with access to over 2,400 high-quality online courses, all for one low monthly price. To try it free for seven days, visit lynda.com slash knowhow. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash knowhow. And by Squarespace, the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website or online portfolio. For a free two-week trial and 10% off, go to squarespace.com and use the offer code KNOWHOW. On this episode of Know How, Project Aura, we take your feedback, a little demo of Heartbleed and Windows 8 tips. Welcome to Know How. It's the Twitch show where we build, bend, break, and upgrade. I'm your host, Father Robert Ballas here. And I'm Brian Burnett. For the next uh, 30 minutes or so, we're going to take you through some projects, show you some of the stuff we've been geeking out to, and uh, this is one of those special feedback episodes. So we get to talk to the people that have been communicating with us on Google+. Yeah, because we love you. We love you, and you know we take a lot of our show from what you ask us for, so uh, we thought this might be a good time to, to kick some of that off. But before we do that, have, what? have you heard about this project, Aura? Ooh, is that the modular cell phone? Yeah, yeah. So I, I kind of dismiss this at mm -hmm. first because I get flashbacks to my childhood where <laughs> we had laptops that were quote unquote modular, and right. it was so awesome. It would be the last thing you buy ever because yeah. you could replace the screen. In fact, there was mm -hmm. this one from a company in Fremont where I used to live, uh, from Everex, and they had you know they were CPU modules and a yeah. monitor module and a battery module and a hard drive module. Put and it, it was all like, together yourself. I know it's like the transformer. Of laptops. I know, I, I honestly thought this is the last thing you will ever buy. It was crazy expensive. It well, like, yeah, because it's modular. Yeah, it was like $6,000. And back then, that'd be like $24,000. But that's now. all you'll ever have to buy because, you know, you'll be putting it together. It's like Legos. Once it's you buy exactly. a big pile of Legos, you can put together however you want. Who doesn't like Legos? But there's always one big problem with all the modular projects, and that mm. is if you're good at everything, you're not great. At, at anything. anything. Yep, right. yep. Yeah, so it would be fast, but the battery life would be horrible. Maybe you could get a better screen, but then, you know, not all the programs looked right. And, and it was, you know, the modular thing, even though it was a cool promise, yeah. nothing ever quite fit together right. Yeah. You, you really did look like you had just, a bunch of stuff. Just kind of hodgepodge together. Yeah, hodgepodge, not a good look, not a good look. Yeah, you know, and even upgradable laptops. A friend of mine bought a laptop with the, the idea that, oh, you know, don't worry, I'm going to upgrade the video card in this in a couple of years, and it'll be fine. And you it's never like, do. They didn't keep it, up, keep it up to date. They right. didn't keep making hardware for it. So. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, that's always been one of the problems, which is if you lock in the mod modularity of your device. It means you kind of have to constrain using new devices, otherwise you kind of lose everyone that came before you, or you have to say, right. well, everything you bought before, you should get rid of that because we've got the new hotness. Right, but this project, so this is cell phone specific, and this is the idea of being able to switch out hardware for your cell phone to like add a bigger battery, change the camera, you know, build it to the way you want, but it uses like magnets to hold things in and stuff? Yeah, yeah, so uh, Project Aura is part of Google's, uh, uh, it's kind of their, sk their skunk works, right? Mm. Uh, the project actually came out of one of their DARPA competitions. Uh, what they created was an endoskeleton. Everything is built on this, and I, I think Alex has some, so yeah, exactly, that's what, it's, what it looks like. It looks the, cool. It does look cool, and it looks like a, an interesting smartphone, but all those little rectangles, uh, those are actually modules that are magnetically held to the, uh, to, to the structure, to the skeleton. Now, this endoskeleton doesn't just use like a magnetic lock. Mm -hmm. they, they call it electro-permanent magnets, which means you can turn them off which makes it easy to, to remove the modules. Okay. Now, the, the thing about this, and the reason why they say this is different than any other modular project that you've seen before, is that uh, the endoskeleton allows the other modules to see what is attached 
to that endoskeleton and then interact with one another. Okay. Uh, this means you can have a common platform that uses different screens, different processors, different communication That's modules. That's just the shell. That's that just you the attach shell. Things to. Right. Okay. And the, the, the nice thing about it is we've come to a point where most phones are just kind of riffs off of each other, right? Oh, yeah. A different size screen, maybe a bit more memory. This lets you choose exactly what you want in your phone and then upgrade the things that you, you no longer like. As you go along, I guess. Like, yeah. maybe you decide you want a better camera down the line or something like that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, the, it, uh, this, the slim form factors allows the modules to be attached easily. And I think the real revolutionary concept here isn't the technology. It's that Google isn't trying to make money off this phone. We know this. This is, this is Google's MO. They don't want to make money off the hardware. They just want to a... To showcase something. Yeah, right? it's showcase. A, a, an ecosystem that encourages third parties to come in and build modules. Now, th the big problem with those modular laptops is one company wanted to make all the money off of it, which right. meant ultimately... And it was closed. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. closed yeah. and doomed. Closed dies. We know that. Closed yeah. will eventually die. This, since there's a standard that they've given to everyone and said, as long as you adhere to the standard, you'll be able to talk to every other module could foreseeably mean that the same endoskeleton that allows you to build your $1,000 luxury mobile device right. also allows you to build the sub-$100 super inexpensive device. That, I, I really like that idea, but I also kind of want to yeah. you know, not get too excited about it because obviously the way things work now with cell phones is they kind of die off after a couple of years, like the new one comes out. Mm -hmm. Like, so when you you have this modular design, is it gonna be like, well, you know, I'm gonna have to shed these these other mods to make my phone up to date, and then what do I do with like the old pieces? Like, do I right. put together another phone and then give it to my kid or something? And that was my first my first thought. When I, when I saw this project, I'm like, oh, this is just another bunch of stuff that's gonna be sitting in a box. Yeah. It's kinda cool, but am I actually gonna use it? Uh, yeah, like, I, am I gonna be swapping stuff out all the time, yeah. or am I just gonna have one configuration that I never touch again? But here's where I think it could be useful. Imagine you have that one endoskeleton and you have the screen that you like. Yeah. But then you change the modules depending on what you're going to do with it. And, and your true. daily driver, you know, you want a certain amount of memory and you want a certain amount of capabilities and you definitely want the wireless connection module. But let's say now you need something that's going to last a long time. Right. So you strip it all down and you put in the module that'll allow it to last for five days. Give it the big battery the or big, something. Yeah, like the that. super huge battery and the slower processor. That's, I could actually see that, you know, customize your device mm -hmm. for what you're going to do that day, rather than what a lot of people do is they have multiple <laughs> devices, so oh, I'm taking this one and this one, or I didn't leave that one at home. Yeah, I could see, yeah. A, I could see a future. I, I don't think I could see Samsung making pieces for it, because they have no. their phones that they want to sell, yeah. and, you know, Lenovo just bought Motorola, so it's like, who's going to get into this game to build the modules and stuff? But... That, that is cool. I like that idea. And one of the things, that, uh, if it does open up for like a lot of people and third parties get into it, I saw a, um, it was a mock-up of a game controller that just attaches to it also. So it's like, it, it, fold, it like clamshell folded. So it's like, you could turn your phone into something better than just, you know, the phone. You could turn it into right. like a game thing with the, the pad and everything. Yeah. Instead of having to buy, I have those MOGA controllers for my phone. Those are okay, but I don't want to carry like the MOGA controller with me everywhere. But if it was an attachment for the phone that just folded together and I could still slide it in my pocket, that'd be cool. Now, I, we're tech people, so we tend to be a bit cynical. And so we're mm. seeing all the downsides. But I got to say, as the optimist in me is, is saying... Yes. I want this, to believe. I want to believe. This believe. could be kind of cool. I want it to be like feel the dreams. Like if Google builds it, they will come. Yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> now, now, people in the chat room are pointing out, like Gardner saying, oh, but Samsung will make a different version with slightly different... <laughs> yeah, that could I happen. Guess, yeah. But, but, here's... And this is why I think this, this approach is genius, what Google is doing. If they really open it up to all parties yeah. and Samson starts making their proprietary modules, but LG is making modules that fit every phone, well, I mean, someone's going to win out. Yeah. And it's probably not going to be the person who makes devices that only fit their models. Well, I guess you'll just you'll find out how long that walled garden is going to work out for you, you know? I dig, dig under the wall. Get garden. under that, that yeah. I'm not going over <laughs> this, this. No, no, no more climbing. Well, that's pretty cool. I do, I do like that idea, and I'm hopeful for it. I'm hopeful, and you know what? It's learning stuff. I like 
learning stuff. Yeah, because then you know more about your phone yeah. and you can build it to your likes or dislikes. Because I know certain people buy phones that don't have cameras because they can't take it to like certain projects with a camera on it. Or maybe you want to give a phone to your kid and build it yourself and, and have them build it and make sure it doesn't have a camera or something like yeah. that. So yeah. that's cool. But you know, anything that, that adds to the, the wealth of knowledge in the world is, <laughs> is a good We're thing. Cool We're cool with that. cool with that. Especially now, when it has a cool name with the electromagnetic. Ele Electropermomagnetic. Yeah, yeah, I like that idea. Now, you know what doesn't have electro-permanent magnets, but is really big into learning? Uh, Padre? Is that you? It's, it's, no. Oh. I second Linda. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Linda. Linda. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. yeah, they're the online learning company. They're, they're the oh, guys who make it easy for you to find out anything about anything. That's right, yeah, that's where I go to brush up on stuff that I've forgotten. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this, Brian. Mm. What do you want to learn this year? Ooh, I want to learn how to code. So well, okay, watching. so software skills, right? Yeah, software skills. Well, how about this? What if I give you a place that you could learn how to code, that you could learn business skills, that you could learn trade skills, that you could learn anything that maybe you had forgotten or, or things that you always wanted to pick up, and you could do it all from the comfort of your own home? And on certain mobile devices, too? Mobile devices, laptops, desktops, pretty much anywhere you want to learn, any way you want to learn, any time you want to learn. What if I were to say there were a company out there that said, hey, yeah, yeah, we'll do that. Yeah, and is it all curated and nicely filmed and stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and with good lights, with good audio, with good sound, with, with good studios. Cool. Yeah, this tell me about too it. Too bad that doesn't exist, right? It has to. Exist. It has to. Actually, it does exist, and it's called lynda.com. Now, Linda just released a course on Arduino this week, so you can start programming interactive objects with Arduino Uno, the open source single board microcontroller. You can also learn how to set up your GoPro Hero to start capturing skills, videos, or even time-lapse photography. It's something that we've done here on Know How, and we love that Linda has picked up. You could also learn how to get great sports footage. It's not as easy as just pointing the camera in the right direction. You need to have the skills to capture the shots that you want. There's also a course on black magic cameras where you can get to know the features of the popular cinema and production 4K cameras, which if you didn't keep up with some of our footage from NAB and other events, is really the only 4K high definition streaming cameras that you can find at an affordable rate. And you can decide if black magic cameras are right for you. It's, it's one of the things that Linda's lets, Linda lets you do. Oh, if you're interested in 3D printing, Linda also lets you learn the basic of what 3D printing is and how you can use it to create objects from prototypes to working tools. Now, I, I have been using Linda recently for Python. We're using it as a module for Coding 101. And uh, I, I like it because it fills in the gaps. It allows me to remember the stuff that I had done previously and to, well, recall the stuff that I, I loved so much about that proging, programming language. I think that's one of the key elements of Linda, which is it's not just for people who want to learn new things. It's for those people who think they may need to brush up on some of the skills that they've let lapse. Linda is great for all those types of people. Now, Linda has over 2,400 courses with more added weekly. All lynda.com courses are produced at the highest quality, not, you know, the homemade YouTube videos. There's nothing right. wrong with those. No, no But no. sometimes you want really good audio. Sometimes you want really good lighting. Sometimes you want clear and crisp video and people who actually understand how to present. And lynda.com works with software companies to provide you updated training the same day that new versions hit the markets. You'll always have the latest skills. At lynda.com, those instructors are accomplished professionals, not just in classroom teachers, but people who have actually worked in the field that they're teaching about. They have courses for all experience levels, from beginner, intermediate, and advanced, and you can watch from your computer, your tablet, or your mobile device. Whether you have 15 minutes or 15 hours, each course is structured so that you can learn from start to finish. You can also search the transcripts to find quick answers or read along with the video. Lynda.com also offers certificates of completion when you finish a course, which means you can publish to your LinkedIn profile, which is, which is great if you're a professional in the field and you want to show people what you've studied. So here's what we want you to do. If you want to learn, if you want to know how to do things, learn something new with Lynda.com. It's only $25 a month for access to the entire Lynda.com course library, or for $37.50 a month, you can subscribe to the premium plan which includes exercise files that let you follow along with the instructor's projects using the exact same assets. And you can try lynda.com right now with a free seven-day trial. Visit lynda.com slash knowhow to access the entire library. That's over 2,400 courses free for seven days. It's all at lynda.com slash knowhow. And we thank Linda for their support of knowhow. All right, let's get into some other learning.
Oh, feedback. Ah, uh, feedback time from Google Plus. Yeah, you know, it's it's our community, right? We we've got that that uh, community at gplus.to slash know-how. Right. And we want people to participate. And one of the ways that we encourage you to participate is send we send us take, questions. We yeah, you send us questions, you send us your projects, and we take a look at a few of them. Now we've brought in a special consultant. It's, oh yeah. Yes, that's right. Yeah, a yeah. special guest that we need for feedback. Yeah. So uh, you know what? Let's let's take you to the sky desk. We're gonna satellite over. <laughs> and ask Greg, our, uh, our super consultant, to uh, read off the first of the feedback. Hey, guys. How's it going? Oh, hey, Greg. <clears throat> oh, All right. Greg. Well, to start us off, we have Marcelo <laughs> Henrique Almeida, uh, who wants to know, is there a hard drive limit on the Linksys WRT1900AC? Ooh. Ooh. I and like this that. this thing's brand new. <laughs> yeah. If you switch to our overhead product camera, this, this is the hotness. We took a look at this last week. Uh, I've been running this through its paces. Oh, my gosh. This is so nice. <laughs> Seriously, uh, I've never seen uh, someone get so excited about a, a rabbit, router. but if they were going to get excited, this, this is the this one. This would be the one. So this is the 1900AC right now. It's powered up. Believe it or not, it, it is powered up. Now, I, I, for people who ha who've used other WRT products, maybe that doesn't sound so exciting that it's not super loud. But this is almost like an enterprise or actually an SMB class router. And it doesn't have a screaming fan. I like that. No, it's yeah, silent. Right. But we're not talking about the fan. We're talking about this, these hard drives. He wants to know if he can plug in large hard drives on this thing. Now this has USB 3, USB 2, and eSATA ports, so right. you can plug in any of those interfaces. And what are you using right now? For this, this this is a 2 terabyte eSATA drive. Cool. Now at, I mean, sorry, a USB 3 drive. At home, I plugged in a 3 terabyte eSATA drive. Yeah. And uh, well, go and switch over to my computer. This is one of the things that I really like about the uh, 1900 AC. You know, you don't need. There, there are some other routers that you can you can use the storage sharing if you like load a special client, which is that's whack. That's horrible. Mm -hmm. You should never do that. This does simple Samba sharing. So 192.168.1.1. If I do that, I get right into this. Is all the stuff on that hard drive, nice. which you know it's super super. And not only that, it's crazy fast. That loaded up quick. Yeah, exactly. I I, was, I, I haven't clocked it yet. I'm still doing that for the benchmarking. But uh, yeah, as far as hard drive capacities on this, I'm, I'm pretty sure anything up to three terabytes will work just fine. Cool. Uh, as, as they add the more popular four terabytes, and I believe there's actually a six terabyte drive on the way, what? We'll, we'll have to see if the firmware supports that. Wow. Well, that's cool. Did you do any other tests on it? Or? Um, well, I mean, I, <laughs> I, did, I did some uh, load testing. Well, one of the things that um, I like to do when I get new routers is yeah. I have a, I have a box. It's what? a special box. A special, a special, special box. box I got from a company that does <laughs> stress testing. I'm just imagining like a black box sitting under your bed or something. That it's you, not black. It's yeah. red. And all the enterprise people out there, you know exactly they what know. I'm talking about. You know, you know what the product is. But what it allows you to do is it allows you to send malform packets, bad pa packets, mm -hmm. uh, attack packets at a device just to see how it reacts for would testing. React. Right, cool. and this this is the kind of the thing that kills enterprise class routers. I mean, it, it, if you're going to stress it out, I can yeah. at any given time I can throw about 40 gigabytes of traffic at something. Oh, um, no consumer or SMB router has ever survived like the second round of tests. Tell me, Padre. this is on round How'd seven. How'd you do? She, what? This is on round seven. Oh wow! So they did something right. This is this. I mean, it, it did get really hot, but it's it's done incredibly <laughs> well. So did you hear the fan kick on or anything? Like uh, the fan is actually on right now. Uh, yeah, it's tiny. Yeah. It's really tiny. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's it's. I like this. It is beefy for a router. I mean, that's a lot bigger than the router I have. But Burke says it looks mean. It does look. I mean, it looks like a spaceship. So, yeah. <laughs> but uh, Marcelo, there you go. That's your cool. that's your answer. Yes, go ahead and get one of these and plug in your th two or three terabyte drive, either e uh, USB or eSATA. You'll be you'll be good to go. Cool. What's right. up next, Greg? Well, up next we have Jeff G, who is having some tap confusion. He purchased a ProTap, but he's only able to get traffic in one direction. Mm. Mm. I actually responded to uh, to Jeff G. Now, if you go to my really awesome board that we drew here during the episode where we're talking about, about tapping, uh, so we talked about the difference between a hub and a switch, right? And when you have a hub, you have one packet in and it goes out, or, or one frame all and it goes out. Through every, exactly. all the ports, so it gets yeah. just repeated. Another name for a hub is a repeater. Mm -hmm. On a switch, it goes in through one port and it looks for the port to which the device it's sent to is attached. Right. And it will go out only that port. Well, in the, uh, in the drawing that we made for the actual network, we showed how you could have your cable DSL, then I wanted you to put a hub here, and then you could have your tapping device 
then you would go to your switch to PC1, 2, and 3. The problem that Jeff G is having is that he bought a, uh, a Pro Tap, which is really cool. It's that little Ninja Star Tap. Oh, yeah, I've seen him right. use that. And he's complaining that he can only get traffic in one direction, either going out to the network or out to the internet. Okay. Which, unfortunately, is not a defect. That's how that works. Uh, the, the, the Pro Tap will yeah. only give you traffic in one direction, it will not aggregate it. There, okay. Now, there are things called aggregated taps, but we don't use them much because the problem is if I have, let's say this is a one gig connection, right? All right. I actually have two gigs of data flowing here, one gig going that way and one gig coming this way. It's, it's bi-directional. Okay. Yeah. Like if two I, lanes of traffic. Two lanes of traffic, exactly. If I have a aggregating tap for one gig, uh, a one gig aggregating tap, that means that at, at any, any time both links, both pathways yeah. reach 50% of their traffic, I am saturated on the link to my recording device because that's only one gig. Okay, so it's like it it can't it can't, it can't just, accept that can't much. accept it. Just start dropping packets. Uh, so most taps, at least the, the inexpensive ones, mm -hmm. have been designed only to take traffic in one direction, and then you could have two devices, one one monitoring in and one monitoring out. Okay, so is the pro problem also Jeff is having is that he like somewhere along the line is there somewhere. How, what would well, be the optimum way for him to do it? For he, yeah, the optimum way for him to do this mm -hmm. would be to use a hub, not a tap. Mm. Uh, because, uh, again, I, I've got some great taps that could do it, but they cost a lot. A lot of, you know, yeah. like two, three, ten thousand dollars. He probably just wants to keep track of his home network stuff. Precisely. Like, so why get drop a hub. that much money for something? Get a cheap hub off of eBay, and you can still find them for under ten bucks. Just make sure it's hub and not a switch, because sometimes the vendors aren't honest about what they're selling. <laughs> You'll be limited to about 100 megabits of data, uh, which should be okay if all you're trying to do is, is keep track of what's going out to the internet or what's coming in. Okay. Yeah. Well, and then could he get a hub and then test out what he wants to test out and then switch it back to the way it was? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, that's one of the things. Unless, again, unless it's one of those really expensive taps, typically you just put it in to troubleshoot. Right. It's uh, not something you leave for... You don't, you don't leave it there. I mean, I, I do, but <laughs> again, it's, I have better... Well, than you're that. a madman. I'm, I'm mad. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's okay. Get, yeah. So back to the sky desk. Th is, this is actually a related question. Greg, related. what's what we got? <laughs> uh, Vincent Panico wants to know, is someone spying on my computer? Uh, he has a Linux laptop, and he's very frightened. <laughs> this, you could tell by the way he typed the question. It was a little Someone's shaky. watching me. You'd feel the fear. Okay, so first of all, Vincent, calm down, relax. I'm sure that no one's watching you besides Cranky Hippo. <laughs> or everyone's being watched. But the same thing goes on this on this drawing. Uh, the easiest way to find out whether or not some someone is doing something to your computer is to watch your traffic, uh, because there's all sorts of ways that people can disguise. What, what they're doing on your computer. In fact, mm -hmm. we saw this on, if you watched This Week in Enterprise Tech a few weeks back, we had Raphael Mudge on, and that he showed us. Show. Yeah. yeah, and he showed us how you could use a thing called a pivot to take over a computer. It does, it, and the person sitting in front of the computer has no idea someone's roaming around his or her computer as him, like with full administrative wow. access. You can't tell from watching the computer, but. If you if watch the traffic. Watch the tra there's no way to disguise the traffic. If, the, yeah. if there's traffic going out of the computer, like if you're watching your traffic and you're not doing anything on your computer and suddenly you notice there's a, a gigabit of traffic leaving your computer. <laughs> what the heck is that? It's probably something wrong. Yeah, so just put a tap, put a tap in there, put a hub in there. Just watch that link. Uh, now, it can be a little bit confusing. Uh, Wireshark is the program that I am, I'm suggesting to you, which is available on all platforms. Right. And um, it's... It can be difficult to decipher the traffic, but capture a lot of it. Uh, and, and then you can tell over time, oh, wait a minute, what's this address? Why is my computing going to this address? Why is it sending this packet? Why did it send so much data over this amount of when time? When I wasn't doing anything. When I wasn't doing anything. The, the thing for me with uh, Wireshark is it's just it's kind of hard to filter through everything that you get from it. Because you get all that yeah, it's, traffic. Yeah, it's drinking from a fire. And I think that's the, the mistake people make is they watch Wireshark for a couple like, minutes and they see all... These numbers flying up like, and down the screen. What's going on? Yeah, yeah. No, it's not what you want. I mean, unless, unless you are crazy experienced at... at deciphering net flows. What you want to do, let it run for an hour. Right. Let it run for a day, whatever it's going to be. And then use, it actually has built-in tools to give you TCP analysis. And that's what you want to look and at. And that's what you want to look at. Cool. Right. Thanks, Padre. No problem. <laughs> now this next question I like. All right, go ahead, Greg. Next question is from Lee Ball. 
He has money, wants to buy stuff. Uh, he has 170 pounds and a 17-inch uh, TFT monitor and a 250-gigabyte SATA hard drive. Uh, should he upgrade the monitor or get a SSD? 170 Ooh. pounds. I don't know. That's like that, that uh, <laughs> like British money, right? Uh, yeah. Is that what they're like, using? Convert, 170 pounds is like, what, like a million dollars? Or something? It must be. I know. Yeah, he should just... totally upgrade then. <laughs> okay. I wish I had that much pounds. <laughs> no, so he's looking at 200 plus dollars. Mm. And uh, actually, this is this is a good question. We... Thank boom, you. Boom, boom. I don't know. If, is that the symbol for pounds? Yes. yes Sweet. It is now. <laughs> 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 All right. So, yeah, this is a question that we get a lot. I have an X amount of money. Hmm. What should I use on the upgrade? Now, I, we can't give you an answer for this. We can give you some answers because it depends on what you do. For example, hmm. if you were a graphic artist... The, you'd one go of, monitor. You'd go monitor, right? Yeah. I mean, you'd want a bigger monitor. I, yeah, 17 inch is kind of tiny, actually. Yeah, it, it's, it's not a great monitor, but here's the thing. If you're a gamer, I would rather have a faster rig than a bigger monitor. Yeah, it depends. It's like, okay. And, and it's also like... If you spend a little bit more, you could get this. Or if you spend, if you had just maybe if you had 180 pounds, you could get a, yeah. an SSD and a monitor or something. But it, you know, if you want that instant response, you want to see that like really quick upgrade. Uh, the SSD is going to make a big difference with loading stuff. Yeah. yeah. See, yeah. This, so this is my go. This is a, a thing we did a while back for for know how. The exact same computer, exact same operating system. The computer on the left loaded up, since it had an SSD, in a minute and four seconds. That computer on the right is just going to keep priming for, just priming and priming and yeah. priming. Now remember, exact same system, same CPU, same amount of memory. It's actually a clone of the operating systems, it, you know, identical systems, and that one change, just, just the SSD upgrade of a hard drive is making the difference between loading up in a minute and four seconds and what's going to turn out to be about a minute and 46 seconds. Yeah. So you're looking you know, somewhere in the vicinity of a 70 to 80% to speed boost just by replacing your hard drive with an SSD. That's, that's actually the, the second upgrade that I would suggest. The first upgrade, if you're really looking for speed, would be memory. Now, you didn't say how much memory you had in your system, right. but if you had like four gigabytes of memory, upgrading that to 16 or even eight gigabytes would make a big difference. Now, here's the thing. You don't have to buy a crazy expensive SSD. What I would suggest is you get some... Now, people know that I'm a big fan of the Kingston line. Mm -hmm. Don't buy cheap. This is, this is a really, really inexpensive 830, Samsung 830. Uh, and there's also really inexpensive Kingston, the value line. Don't mm -hmm. get those because, you know, they do all sorts of things to shave dollars off their prices so they can sell their value line. Hmm. The higher end, like the, the 840 Pro from Samsung or the Kingston uh, KC series, the KC300, you can get decent sized SSDs, you know, 128 to 256 gigabytes for about 90 to 120 bucks. That leaves you a good, what, 150 bucks to get something else, and be it memory or a slightly bigger monitor. Yeah. What do you think? Uh, what would your choice be? I would probably go SSD. Just because once well, once you go SSD, it's hard to go back because you know everything boots up really quick. Uh, but if you're doing like any gaming or if you're doing any video editing and stuff, ah, the monitor. Yeah. We could, if you're doing video video editing, okay, I've got it. If you're doing video editing, you don't do the SSD because it's yeah. small. You're gonna you're gonna have to pay a lot of money if you want a big SSD. Uh, but if you're happy with the monitor and you want your system to snap. Get the SSD. Yeah, if you said you had like a 17-inch CRT, I'd say, okay, go with an LCD. <laughs> yeah. But if it's a 17-inch LCD, unless it's a horrible 17-inch LCD, I, I, I'd take the speed. I think I, yeah, especially since, uh, th and this is what I like about the SSD upgrade versus, say, the memory upgrade. Uh, if you buy a modern SSD, even if your computer can't handle the, the interface, mm -hmm. like the super fast interface, your next computer will. That's true, and so you can hang yeah, on to it. You'll hang on to it. Yeah. Right. And that's another reason to buy one of the nicer ones because don't they have longer read-write? Yeah, so. yeah, exactly. And again, uh, I know there are people who are going to hark on any brand, it could, uh, Kingston, Samsung, Crucial, because, oh, the drive died after a while. Yeah, if you buy the crappy drives, you're going to get a crappy experience. Yeah. Don't, don't buy the... No one in, my, in the know-how community, none of you know-it-alls, should <laughs> ever be buying a value drive. There, I've said it. You tell them, Padre. Okay, good. Okay, Double back brain. back up to 3,000 feet, hovering above the Twit Studios is Gregory Burnett. What's next? Well, up next is Lenny Craig, and he has a multi-floor setup and wants to know if he can daisy-chain his routers. 
That's a good question. Uh, we get this a lot. Uh, people say, well, you know, I got a new router, but I got this old router. Um, I want to use it. It's yeah. got wireless. <laughs> OK. OK, yeah. So can you? You can. You can. Yeah. There's only one thing. You got to turn off the DHCP server on Right. One of them. Use it as like a, a bridge? Yeah, like, yeah. Well, so, well if, if, here's the thing. So the DHCP server, that's the Dynamic Host Control Protocol. Mm -hmm. It's what allows any computer that connects to your network to automatically get an address. Okay. Right? Right. Which is good. Yeah. We like that. The problem is if you have more than one DHCP server, then it's like, they kind of compete. Like yeah. they'll be handing out addresses and sometimes the device will get this address sometimes. No. Go into the settings and just turn off the DHCP server on one of them and then you can use the other one as just basically a switch and an access point. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that's perfectly doable. Cool. So how many could you, could you do more than two? Do I would, three, I would never suggest daisy chaining more than, uh, than three ops. Okay. Huh. You get weird things after three ops. <laughs> Don't do could we daisy chain like three of these? No. Uh, Wouldn't it be worth yeah, it. It's like 750 bucks worth of hotness. <laughs> no. Yo, just okay. get a switch okay. if you're going to do that. Switch. What's wrong with you? <laughs> okay. We're crazy, but we're, we're not crazy. that no, crazy. Not that crazy. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. What's next, Greggy? Uh, all right. Well, our buddy Vincent is back, and he wants to know if he, uh, he has a broken screen or a busted laptop. Basically, he has an old Toshiba. Uh, the screen went out. He went to Best Buy, and they told oh. him the motherboard went out. Okay. Oh. See, first problem, you went to Best Buy. Yeah, that's a mistake. <laughs> Those guys God. are smart, aren't they? <sighs> the Geek Squad. <laughs> Okay. Well, did he test it out with another monitor? Like, he could have plugged well, it. So they told him the motherboard was dead, so he, he went and bought another motherboard, and he plugged it in, it's the exact same thing. Same thing oh, right? Man. Now, he, I, I, let me tell you, I, I can almost guarantee that this is the problem. The problem isn't the motherboard, because you said that you were getting some function out of the laptop. The problem is that the backlight of the LCD died. I'm betting it's not even like the entire screen, yeah. especially on some of those older models, especially the cheaper models. They used really janky CFLs, the cold fluorescents. Yeah. And what happens is the, uh, the inverter for those CFLs die. And when it dies, it leaves the screen in darkness. It looks like the computer's off, but it's actually on. Now, there's a really easy way to tell. What you do is you take your laptop outside and you like, Put it at an angle, try to get the light off of it, oh. and you can still you would be see, able to see the image. It won't be won't be right. perfect, but you'll see it. If you see the image, then you know, yeah, it's just the CFL. Just go right. ahead and go on the eBay, buy a new inverter, you're good to go. Okay. Yeah, that's too bad that he already got a motherboard for it. Yeah, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Best Buy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's next, Greg? Well, Vincent's life is just full of questions because he's up again and he wants to know: <laughs> Will cryptocurrency mining kill my PC? There was a suspicion yes. that crypto <laughs> mining killed one of the PCs here at Twit, but I swear nobody did that. So interesting. Um, Roll that B-roll. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So this, you know, you're talking about this. Of course, if you're doing crypto mining, you probably have the the side off your computer because it does heat it up. If you look at this, the the, uh, the screen for the actual client. It, it'll tell you how hot the computer is getting. Really, when you're running crypto, that's your only enemy. Right. Heat. heat. Allowing heat to build up in your computer is going to cause serious issues. Not just for, like, your video <laughs> card. This is from that computer. See how the, well, the heat sink kind of exploded? All right. To be fair, though, isn't there supposed to be some built-in safety parameters that when, like, these, this hardware gets to a certain temperature, it shuts down the computer? It's supposed to. <laughs> Obviously, doesn't, that didn't doesn't always do that. that. Doesn't always yeah. do that. But yeah, what I'd say is, yeah, if you're worried about the longevity of your computer, it's just cooling. So go ahead and get. You, you saw in that that uh, little video, I had a small secondary fan that was blowing cooler air into the case. Mm -hmm. uh, now, now that I'm no longer doing cryptocurrency mining, I, I've gone ahead and shut up all my cases, and it's nice and quiet. But heat is really the only thing that's going to stop you from going much Doge, many Bitcoin, so Litecoin. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> heat is the enemy. Heat's the enemy. Okay. All right. From heat to uh, Wi-Fi? Neighbors are destroying. Oh, sorry. What Greg. a transition. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, Capel Kerr, I'm sorry if I totally destroyed your name here, oh. uh, lives in a condo building with 10 floors. Everyone has Wi-Fi, and it's totally killing his. He has an idea, though, to use paint to block his neighbors out. Okay, this is not a new, a new Use thing. Use like lead-based paint or well, something? Well, it's, it's a, you, know, you want some sort of paint, some sort of material that is conductive. And what will happen is the RF signals will actually hit that conductive and surface. And bounce off? Well, or, slightly bounce, but hopefully it. get absorbed. Ah, uh, okay. Right. Um, it can work. Is it worth it? 
I don't think so. I mean, if you, if you look at that link, it'll actually show you the Y Shield paint. It's expensive stuff. It's 80 mm -hmm. bucks a, a, a barrel, depending on what kind of size room you're going to need. You might need a couple <laughs> of these. You will get attenuation. You absolutely will. Is it worth how much money it's going to cost to properly coat your room? Almost never. Almost, almost never. In fact, it's almost cheaper to make yourself a copper mesh and live what? in a Faraday cage. <laughs> what if you did tinfoil? It's just all over the walls and stuff. Haven't no? you? Didn't you? Well, see, you didn't grow up when I grew up where tinfoil got you better reception on a TV. <laughs> oh, with like, like rabbit, rabbit ears, ears or something? Yeah, yeah. No, no. But I, what I'd say is, don't don't mess with that. Uh, you, you go back to our episode on troubleshooting. Uh, uh, Wi-Fi and you yeah. can find some of the ways you can determine if there's a clear channel. My advice to you would be if you are in a very RF active building, abandon 2.4. Just yeah. assume anything on 2.4 is going to be dead. Move to 5 gigahertz. All your devices, all your routers should be 5 gigahertz. You'll, you'll be fine. It's a big enough a playground where even if you have a few of your neighbors on 5 gigahertz, you should get decent throughput. Yeah, instead of spending that 80 bucks on paint, you should probably spend put it towards a router. If, right. And then run 5 gigahertz. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, uh, just so you know, I, I did check. If you put that lead-based slashed particle, particulate-based paint in an apartment building, you will not get your deposit back. <laughs> they, they count that as a contaminant. So You don't know this by experience, no. do you? No, of no. course not. <laughs> just don't do it. Just don't do it. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, Hold what on. do we got Please. next, Greggy? So... Next, we have uh, Mark Durish. Uh, he just finished his Raspberry oh, yeah. Pi uh, main project, and he wanted to show it off to the know-how community. Yes. Yeah, yes. So this was cool. I, I'm sure a lot of the audience remembers a, a episode a long time ago mm -hmm. now, it feels like. Uh, I did that main project where you, me, and I was all awesome. worked together, and we put it inside of an NES. And uh, it was a really cool project, one of my favorites. Um, but So Mark did it, too, after watching our episode. But I am jealous, because this guy did a really good job. Uh, these are some pictures off of his blog, but he actually used a 3D printer, which I would have liked to have done, but ours wasn't working. Um, but really, it looks it looks so good. He un it's, it's really nice. It's clean. not molested at all. He just that one cut in the back of the. the panel I like how there. he used your tip of of taking like the keystone jack and just yeah. topping it off to the back. That's yeah, it's a good way to go. Yeah, smart. And then so he took it a step further. What I did is we used we just used USBs. Right. I was just gonna keep it simple, use USBs um, for the controllers. But he actually wired up the original NES <sighs> uh, stuff to it. But he wasn't finished at that either. He took SNES stuff too, and he he wired that up and he put it in where you slide in the cartridge. That's so now, awesome. Yeah, yeah. So he can use the original NES controllers. He can also use the original SNES controllers, and he just has to oh. flip up the door right we, there. You know, we were always figuring something to do with that door. Yeah, I mean, like, we, we, we got wanted to put, empty like, space. We want to put something. We wanted to put, uh, I think one of our ideas was put, like, a, a hard drive inside yeah. of a cartridge yeah. that you put in there. Or, or put it like a, a, a drive, like a something, CD-ROM drive, that, yeah. so that you can play movies or something. And then you have never to blow it out every once in a while, like, pff, 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 right. to make <laughs> it work put right. It in. And, Tried a couple of times, but that's, that's smart. No, very, very well done. Geeked out. We want, we want to see more of those projects. When you show us your projects, we want to put them on the show, just because we're proud. I mean, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, you well, guys grow up so fast. I know, and especially when they're better than what we did. So, so thank you, Mark. Thanks for uh, sharing that with everybody. Uh, oh, and I feel bad. <laughs> Do better projects. We only had a week. Who knows how long Mark had to work oh, on man. it? All right. But man, that move looks on, like move on. Excuses, I'm Brian. I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks like uh, Mike Robertson has found a Dogecoin in his backyard. Oh wow. man. Yeah, that was on the community. <laughs> I had to share. I it saw that. I saw you choosing that. I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> it's more well, like just a Doge. Somebody probably sacrificed their computer to to for that Doge coin right there. Such a scenario. whole Doge just came out of their computer <laughs> as their GPU melted. So. <laughs> Had to give Mike a, a shout out for the Doge, <laughs> and then we have finally we have an episode idea. Do you want to read it off, Greg? Go sure, Ryan. <laughs> what, what was the next report, Greg? Uh, it's an episode idea for Steam OS by uh, Joseph uh, Ghana. <laughs> yeah, that works for me. Uh, yeah, well, I wanted I wanted to bring this one up because uh, we get a lot of show ideas, and I want to encourage people to you know let us know what they're interested in. And, we we'll, might do a show about it, but uh, Steam OS, like, I want to do a project on that. Yeah, I was thinking about how, how we could do this. 
I, I, we I might need to use co- the budget to build yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. So, Tony, we're going to be breaking some budget here. Uh, we, you know what? This is actually a big enough project. If there are enough people in our community who say that they want to see this, we will absolutely build something SteamOS powered. Uh, so make sure to join our, our G Plus community, again, at gplus.to slash know-how. Mm-hmm. And uh, tell us, is, is this ideas? a project you want to see? Yeah, submit yeah. ideas, submit future projects, and absolutely show us pictures, videos, whatever, of the projects that you do. We'll feature them right here on Know How. Once a month. We're going to do this once a month. Yep, yep. As long as Greg, uh, Greg's schedule allows for it, because we can't do it without Greg. Well, I mean, look, look at that guy. Look, look you, just, you just trust him. Is he, uh, He's got that trusting face. <laughs> All right, well, okay, that's the end of the feedback. Now, coming right up, I wanted to show you a little something-something. You know how last week we talked about Heartbeat, right? Yes, we, we did, gave people yeah. that jelly bean explanation. It well, finally made sense for it, a little... Exactly. And I, we got a lot of really good comments, both from this and from the know-how uh, explanation. We, yeah. we did basically the same thing. And uh, now that people understand how it works, I thought maybe we should finally show them what it looks like in action. Yeah, because I'm a visual person, so I think yeah. they'll help. Yeah. No. So we're going to do that, and we're going to bring you some Windows 8 tips when we come back. But first, I thought... Hey, you know what? Let's talk about another sponsor of the know-it-alls, of, of know-how. Specifically about a sponsor who mm-hmm. has great service, who allows you to create a clean website, who allows you to choose from templates that they've created that all look beautiful and original, who have almost 99.9999999% uptime, right. and who handle all the muss and the fuss, all the hassle of running your own website. So you don't have to get your hands dirty. You can just focus on your content? Well, I, I'd say you can get your hands dirty if you, if you want, want to. to. Yeah, that's but true. otherwise, you just publish and go. Yeah, that's what I do. Of course, I'm talking about Squarespace, Brian. Oh. Have you heard about Squarespace? I have heard of Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform that makes it easy for you to publish what you want to publish. Now, if you have a, a blog, if you have a website, then you need Squarespace. It's, it's a platform that allows you to worry more about the content that you're creating than the platform that you're publishing it on. And that's, that's always a good, way, a good thing. Now, this is a great way to share a weekend project blog or provide the ability to jumpstart a, a side startup project with a professional-looking site and the ability to quickly and easily take orders and sell creations. No more of those blogs with the coming soon or under construction signs. You know, we want actual content and that's what Squarespace lets you do. Focus on the thing that's most important, your passion and everything else you just leave to Squarespace. Now they are constantly improving their platform with new features, new designs and even better support. They're also very flexible. For for DIYers, this is especially important. There are a set of tools to create your own website without code from design tools like Layout Engine to the Logo Creator. It's a platform for customization, especially if you know enough code to get under the hood since the developer platform is super robust. They have beautiful designs. They have over 25 beautiful templates for you to start with. And recently they added a Logo Creator tool, which is a basic tool for individuals and small businesses with limited resources to create a simple identity for themselves. It's easy to use. Squarespace is always there for you if you need help. They have a live chat and email support 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Plus, there is a completely redesigned customer help site for easier access to self-help articles and video workshops. Squarespace also offers e-commerce, of course. I mean, if you eventually want to monetize your your blog or your your, your web page, you're going to want a platform that gives you the ability to enable that. Now, now Squarespace has available for all subscription plans the ability to accept donations, which is great for nonprofits, cash wedding, wedding registries, and school fund drives. They're also inexpensive. Squarespace starts at just $8 a month, and it includes a free domain name if you sign up for a year. Squarespace is mobile ready, which means that if someone brings up your blog, your site on a mobile device, a a tablet or a phone, it's not going to look weird. It's not going to be all shrunk down. It will actually refit the content to fit the screen. You get all of that in your basic subscription. Now, even their code is beautiful. As a coder, I like to look behind the scenes. I like to look at, at the code that's actually generating the page that I see. And Squarespace's code just looks beautiful. Their, their, their back end takes, takes so much precedence in, in the, where they put their resources that they've made sure that the back, the code side, looks as good as the front side. I, I just like that, to see that in a company. Now, they include their hosting, which means that you don't have to worry about multiple fees, one for the registrar, one for the hosting, maybe one for your developer. It's all contained in your subscription fee, which means one pay, then you play. So here's what we want you to do. We want you to try 
Squarespace, free for two weeks with no credit card required. Go ahead and start building your website. When you decide to sign up for Squarespace, make sure to use the offer code KNOWHOW to get 10% off and to show your support for KnowHow. Now we thank Squarespace for their support of KnowHow and remember, a better web awaits and it starts with your new Squarespace website. Squarespace. Yeah. I yeah. love how it just works. Like I You like can work. dig as much as you want into it or you can not touch anything and just upload your content. Don't touch it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what do we got next? Well, Parker? you know, we're running long, so I'm thinking maybe we should jump into the heart bleed explanation. What do you think, Alex? Maybe uh, show the good folks exactly how it works? The best way to test, and because this is an easy bug to test for, is to actually test it. You know, just actually try to take advantage of it. And let me show you how to do that. First things first, I'm going to just go ahead and drag this uh, module onto uh, the second Linux box there. And it's going to go ahead and fire away and just give it a minute. And it's going to come back and say, scan one of one host. And that's its what way of telling me none of those are vulnerable. Sorry, too bad. Good. Now, let's go ahead and drag onto 192.168.113, press launch, and let's see what happens. And we get back that indeed, that there was a heartbeat response with a leak. Oh, hmm. Uh-oh, we've got something that's vulnerable. So that tells me that's a server I need to patch. Now, we're going to go in in a moment, the implications of this, and we're going to actually take advantage of this bug to get back sensitive data. So we know 192.168.113 is uh, potentially vulnerable. So let's go ahead and go there with our browser. And earlier, I created a form, okay? Uh, this form is on this uh, SSL protected website, HTTPS 192.168.1.113. And I'm going to do this from another system. I'm gonna log in with the user Padre Oh, and I need a cool <laughs> password. Padre, what's a good password so you know I'm not making anything up? Uh, cranky Hippo. Let's do that. I'm going to just, from my other system here, Cranky Hippo, and I'm going to press Submit Query. And I just issued a login from my other system that you can't see with Cranky Hippo. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this SSL test program to connect to that server and try to pull back data with the heart bleed problem. And I'm gonna make my terminal just a little bit smaller here so you can capture the whole thing. And let's just come up here. And all I have to do to run this is just give it uh, the actual server I wanna to connect to. Again, it has to be my server, not somebody else's. Right, I don't think we can say that enough. <laughs> yeah, I, because this is so easy to do and yeah. the data you could get back uh, could be very sensitive. It's tempting. I know it's tempting, folks, but don't do it. If you don't own yeah. the box, please. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and just run this. And because that particular server oh, is vulnerable to no. this attack... That's the memory dump. <laughs> it's a memory dump. It's, uh, oh my God. in this case, 64K worth of data. And what you can see here is whatever was in memory of that particular Apache oh. instance I hit. And it's kind of like going to a slot machine. I don't know what I'm going to get. I just know I'm going to get 64K of data each time. So wow. just keep pulling that lever. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try this a couple of times to see if we get lucky and we get back that cranky hippo information. And there we go. The second time's a charm. Oh, no. Oh. Remember, <laughs> I hit that web server from a different client, okay? I logged in with cranky hippo to HTTPS or SSL enabled website and let me know if you can see this up um, in the twilight right here, but there we oh, go. No, we see it. Padre it's right there. The password Cranky Hippo. It's clear okay. text because it's pulling it straight out of memory. Yeah, and keep in mind, this is, this is the heartbeat bug in action. Uh, because there's only me hitting that particular web server, there's not a lot of data to um, potentially get back. I mean, if you had thousands of users hitting that, what I get back each time, it could be anything. Right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you were pulling the, the handle on a slot machine that only had one prize. But if this was an actual server in the wild, it would be filled with all sorts of active data, usernames and passwords and encryption keys. Yeah, and actually to kind of hammer that home a little bit, I'd like to show you, this is a tweet from uh, Mark Lohman uh, a couple days ago. And what he did is he 
or somebody, I don't know if it was him, so I don't want to get Mark in trouble here, but he has a screenshot of this attack uh, several days ago being run against one of Yahoo's mail servers and showing how he was able to, same kind of thing, pull back a username and a password for somebody who recently logged in uh, just before that request was issued, okay? So this is a very serious problem. There is potential for somebody to pull back your sensitive data, but when there's a lot of users, it's not really possible to target a user. You just keep pulling that slot machine over and over again and see what you can get. Yeah, you don't need a specific user if you're getting all the users. Right, it, it, it's pretty scary. And until I set up a lab about two hours ago to play with it more, I, uh, I was convinced that there was a problem. I was just surprised by the reliability of getting sensitive information back. It's pretty scary. Yeah, the scariest part about that is how easy it is to do that exploit. Yeah, I mean, well. those tools, Metasploit, is already on online. You can download it for free. Right. Uh, now, I will say, I, I have to say this. Please, 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 please. I know how easy this looks. Do not run this against boxes you don't own. Right. If, if you are an IT person, go ahead and test your own boxes. But if you do run this attack against anyone, like let's say, oh, I want to find out if my Mo Yahoo account is vulnerable. Yeah, just that's, for fun, right? Technically, that's illegal. Yeah. What, what you're doing is illegal. So, yeah, I don't want anyone to go to jail. Well, and it's it's hopefully been patched in a lot of places, so it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, it totally, <laughs> totally does, by the way. <laughs> I, did, oh, right. I, I, I know someone who may have run a scanning test and found like at least 50% of the servers tested still. Yeah. Okay. Now, we're going to go into our next segment, which is all about Windows 8.1. Sorry, oh, sorry, Padre. Wait, oh. uh, wait, no, wait, we can't do it. There's no time. Wait, uh -oh, no. We ran out of time. No. Just, we, can't, we can't do it. Man, but, but. <sighs> well, I mean, he's the TD, man, so, right. he, he, so he gets final call. Yeah. I'm a director, <sighs> Padre. <laughs> well, okay. I mean, now, now you have it, folks. We, we wanted, wanted to bring to. you the 8.1 hotness. It's going to have to wait another week. Thanks a lot, Alex. But you know what? Shouldn't wait another week. You actually got some letters. That's right. I forgot to mention that, but I got a couple letters. A f couple weeks ago, you said, hey, send us a letter, and we'll send you back swag. I never lie. Well, you put me on the hook. I know. No, wait, wait. I didn't, say, I didn't say we would send you oh, back right. swag. Oh, right. You said I would. Thank you. And then actually on this letter, too, if I go to the product shot, it <laughs> says, a priest wouldn't lie. Well, you can't see it, but it does say... There we go. There we go. D dim those lights. A priest wouldn't lie. This is the biggest envelope I could find, <laughs> and it was like, it was a huge envelope. It was a huge envelope. So, so did I lie? You didn't. I because did because you didn't say you would send it. You okay. Said I would so send did it. you lie? No, I'm going to. Okay. It's so just... can you want to show the folks what they get when they send All us right. envelopes? So you send us the envelopes. You're gonna get this sweet twit sticker because this is the only one we have at the moment, <laughs> and the very rare twit microfiber cloth. Actually, I, where, that, these are cool. Actually. Where are those? Because I, I need. There's totally not a giant box of them at the front desk. So oh, okay. don't, don't even look. All right. So, folks, again, remember, send an envelope, a self-addressed stamped envelope to Cranky Hippo. And, and I will send it back to you, you within four to six months. Yes. Cool. Wow, we're good. Do we have anything left? No, I think that's it. <laughs> so next week, we are going to cover those Windows 8.1 tips. So we're going to be giving you a little something-something from... Uh, a know-how segment that we're starting to introduce. We we know there's a lot of gamers out there, so we thought maybe we'd give you some basic gaming tips. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, was, with all the testing that we do, we run on these games. Testing. We got to do something with those. Yeah, yeah we have. We to, got great we tips tell, of those games that we're testing. We need we need to tell Lisa and Leo that we're actually working. Yes. This is work, folks. This is hard work. Well, we have that gaming PC, and we gotta we gotta stress yes. it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and Acer, by the way, I, that thing will totally get back to you at some point. Sooner or later. But we need to use it for the show, honestly. So it's, it's for, for the, the fans. Good. It's for the greater good. Now, you know what else is for the fans? What's that? Our show notes. That's right. You can find those at twit.tv/kh. Some of the best show notes I've ever seen. And I've seen very few show notes. <laughs> now, what, what I like about those show notes is that if, if we ever run a project that is going too fast, that you think, oh, man, I, I have no idea what they're talking about, we give you notes. We actually tell you exactly what we're talking about. We, you see what we, get to, what we write up on our notes, and you actually get to see step-by-step -step instructions whenever we do a tutorial. So don't worry about missing something. Go ahead and just enjoy the show. Then jump over to the show notes, and we'll tell you to do exactly what we're doing. Right? It's one of the things that we love doing. 
links of yeah. things that we mention and stuff. So if you're like, oh, that feedback episode, there's a question that related, but I don't know where it is. Well, we'll be on their uh, know-how. Yeah. Now, do, do we have a, an email address? Uh, we do have an email address, but we choose not to acknowledge it. Yeah, you could write <laughs> us at knowhow at twit.tv, and we will never answer your questions. No, but, but you know where you could go. Way. Yeah, there's it's a better way. we have that. Remember What's that, yours, Padre? That G Plus community first. Uh, we got to yes, talk about. Exactly. We, we've been we've been plugging the G Plus community. Go to G Plus .to slash. Oh, it's t uh, Twit K H. Uh, yeah. I, I was saying know how. Uh, no, it's Twit K H. Go to Twit K H. And you'll be able to join the community that is incredibly vibrant. At some point, there'll be a picture there with Cranky Hippo in the background. Sooner or later. But those are expensive, folks. Yeah, no, they don't have that kind of money to yeah. pay. <laughs> yeah. but, but if you don't like the G Plus vibe, why not also join us on Twitter? You can find us there. Talk to either of the, either, the, either of us. You can find me at twitter.com slash PadreSJ. And I am at underscore. I always do the underscore, at cranky underscore hippo. Cranky, I wasn't able yeah. to get it with just the cranky hippo. Yeah. Go ahead and follow us, and you'll be able to find out what we're doing each week on the show. And it's a really good way to suggest things to us. Again, we like to listen to our audience. So if you tell us it's you really want quicker. to see something, we get it yeah, right it's away. quicker. It gets, gets into our brain. Also, if you want to send us any hate mail about the fact that we promised you Windows 8.1 tips, you but can, we're not delivering them. You can blame Alex Gumpel. You can blame Alex Gumpel, who's going to turn a camera on himself <laughs> right now. And you find him at twitter.com slash anel3, A-N-E-L-F. I'm at Big Jerk Face Director. That, well, we're going to make com. that now. Hashtag. Hashtag. Hashtag Big Jerk TD. <laughs> Till then, I'm Father Robert Ballasare. I'm Brian Burdett. And now that you know, go do it.